Hi everybody, my name is Brent. Welcome back to my little shop. My days of working and filming in this tiny little shop are numbered because I've restarted my workshop build as well as the series on this channel that is documenting that build. So if you're interested in timber framing, there's all kinds of timber framing content coming up. But as well, we're doing everything associated with the building ourselves. So there'll be all kinds of content on manufacturing wooden windows, manufacturing interior and exterior door, as well as doors with windows in them, interior, exterior molding, wooden siding, uh, bracketry for the outside of the building, as well as the uh, workshop workbenches and workshop cabinetry, as well as a couple different kinds of tongue and groove flooring. So there's all kinds of woodworking, millwork, and especially shaper content coming up because I know a lot of folks are interested in that as well. This video is a little bit of crossover between those two main themes. Um, as a traditional timber framer, I have a regular need for a lot of pegs. All my joinery is connected together with wooden pegs in a traditional form. So what I've typically been doing is purchasing those pegs. I've had a couple of problems lately. One, the cost is going up. It could be anywhere between $500 to $1,000 uh, worth of pegs in a frame, uh, depending on the joinery employed. Uh, but also I've had some problems with quality control recently. So in keeping with the spirit of video uh, a couple of videos ago where we used some cool White Hill tools uh, tooling to make some Festool dominoes out of shop scraps, I'm using some of the larger shop scraps now to make the timber framing pegs. I thought you'd like to tag along while I make my next batch of timber framing pegs. One of the things I've been trying to do with the shaper content on this channel is dismiss a few common myths about the shaper or spindle molder, especially for folks in North America who aren't as familiar with them. Uh, first, first myth is that it is inherently and unavoidably a dangerous machine. The second myth is that in order for it to be a productive member of your shop, you need to invest thousands and thousands of dollars in aftermarket jigs and accessories. And the third myth is that in order for it to be helpful at all for you and your shop, you need to invest thousands and thousands of dollars in tooling. None of those are correct. Looking at the tooling again quickly, I've said on this channel a few times for a relatively modest investment in limiter style European tooling, you can achieve an almost limitless number of different profiles for the relatively modest investment of uh, changing out the relatively inexpensive high speed steel knives. Now, that's great for small to medium production runs, but there's no getting around the fact that carbide tips and carbide insert styles of tooling are excellent for very long production runs or production in very abrasive material. So for that reason, um, uh, my shop is probably 65 to 70% high speed steel tooling in a limiter head and the remainder being carbide insert tooling. I did some quick math and by the time I've made enough pegs for about half a dozen frames, I'm looking at just about a, a mile, a linear mile or almost a kilometer and a half of milling to make all of those pegs. So for that reason, I've decided to invest in a carbide insert style of tooling to help me manufacture these pegs. So let's take a closer look. Okay, sitting on some lovely black locusts that I'm going to turn into timber frame pegs is the cutter head selection for this job. This is a nosing head from Whitehill Tools in the UK. In North America, this would often be called a roundover or a bull nose head. They make these in different sizes depending on the thickness of material that you're using. Now, one great thing about these carbide insert style of cutter heads is the carbide inserts themselves are extremely hard which means they're very long lasting, especially in abrasive materials like this black locust or any man-made material. But what inevitably companies being so hard is they're also a little bit brittle, which means they need to be heavily backed up by the steel body of the cutter head. What that means is there's a limited amount that they can overhang the body of the cutter. That said, each one of these cutter heads will produce a range of different material diameters. Now, typically from the factory, they come with a five degree runoff just to make the transition between the roundover portion and the flat portion of the board a little more gentle. But I've had these knives custom made for me to make a perfect half circle, which means I can make my timber frame pegs in two passes. So let's start getting some material together. Let's get the machine set up and start making some pegs. Other than the black locust, which I did have milled specifically for making pegs, much of the peg stock I came up with is just cutoffs and leftovers from various jobs I've done over the years. Turns out rifling through the scrap pile was a bit of a walk down memory lane. There's some material from a 19th century kitchen renovation I did. There's some cherry 
from a, a hall table that I made for a family that lost everything in a fire. There's some oak for from a set of French doors I made a while ago. So I guess if you have a diverse project history, you have a diverse looking scrap pile. Depending on your methods and approach to this job, some stock may just require planing and cutting down to dimension. Some of mine is a bit too uneven, but I also have some two inch oak that I need to resaw. So I'm jointing it square and straight on two adjacent edges before heading to the bandsaw. Now I think a lot of wars have been started following conversations about resawing on the bandsaw. Now here I'm resawing five and a half inches of white oak on a one horsepower bandsaw with a plain old half inch 3 TPI high carbon steel blade that has been on the saw for a while. I think having a well tuned saw, a blade that cuts true, while finding the sweet spot with respect to feed rate is a lot more important than fancy blades and expensive jigs. In my opinion, many folks overthink the peg material. As long as it's strong hardwood, it's sound without any major defects or a lot of grain run out, it'll work just fine. Now managing small parts on the shaper can be tricky. Breaking through a false fence would usually attach to the main fence through the back with screws will essentially make you a zero clearance fence. Pretty similar to a zero clearance insert like you'd be used to on a table saw. What this does is it closes up any unnecessary fence openings that the stock might want to dive into. It also can help with cut quality and dust collection. Now pushing the fence back out a 32nd of an inch will reduce the noise level, limit heat buildup in the cutters and improve airflow which in turn will improve the dust collection and still do the job just fine. Because I didn't have any table rings the perfect geometry for the cutter I added a false bed too, clamped securely to the table. I'll check the fence quickly to make sure it's still square before I carry on. I'd say we'd be all set for machining square or rectangular stock at this point, as it's pretty easy to reliably keep it up against the fences. However, since we're producing round products that will effectively only have two points of contact, I decided to make some feather boards. Now feather boards on their own would be great, but I decided to take it another step further and make some contoured feather boards. So I had Whitehill make some knives that would match the counter profile of this dowel stock perfectly and machine the edge of the featherboard stock first. Now the rebate in the bottom means that I can attach the featherboard directly to the fence and still have pressure directly centered on the round stock. Lots of repetitive cuts on the table saw made the leaves and I made them in both directions so if I wanted to I could place them on the side as well as the top. So after machining the first side of the stock I replaced the conventional feather boards with our contoured feather boards. I just placed some half finished stock up against the fence and attached the feather boards with some number eight screws, making sure to have even pressure. A quick check shows that the feather boards are working as they should. Now because the power feeder has to be so close to the fence for our narrow one inch stock, we only had room for two short little sections of feather boards, one at the in feed and one at the out feed. Now to make sure everything was working properly, I wanted to do a real world sizing test, not simply rely on calipers. This is a wood owl bit that I traditionally use for drilling the peg holes. So I drilled a hole in a piece of pine and tested some of the first stock that came out of the machine. Everything worked great, so I carried on with the rest of the stock. Now as usual with a heavily jigged up machine, well guarded, especially with a power feeder, there really isn't a lot to see with the milling process. So this first extended test run has worked out really well. I'm really happy with the results. There's probably enough uh, material here for 40 pegs and I expect I've got enough raw material here ready for another 100 more, which is great because I think maybe with another three runs, I'll probably have enough pegs for the whole shop, which is great. Now the White Hill uh, cutter block is working out extremely well. It's providing almost a glass smooth finish. Now we obviously don't need that cosmetically for these pegs, but the reality of it is, is your peg should be tight in the holes that you've pre-drilled into the frame, but there's no reason why there needs to be any more friction than absolutely necessary when driving them in. So I think this peg finish is going to be much nicer to use than the rough stuff that I've been uh, unfortunately having to use the past little while with some commercial pegs. So if you enjoyed this, please hit the, uh, hit the thumbs up. It doesn't cost you a thing, but it does help other folks find this sort of content. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next time.